From the world of politics. You gotta believe that to go after a former president's home in, with a warrant, um, you have got to have the highest level of concern supporting uh, and, and, and that essentially justified by the probable cause finding. To the world of business. We need to help bring prices down in a way that sustains the economic progress that we've made. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Well, we got those numbers we'd all been waiting for this morning, the consumer price index numbers, and they were better than what were feared. We got a 0.0% increase in the headline month over month, in the CPI, and the core was only up three tenths of a percent instead of five tenths of a percent. To take us through those numbers, welcome now Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent Michael McKee. So you were on the set, you were covering it. Were you surprised? Uh, not totally surprised. Uh, the magnitude hard to gauge, but uh, it is one month. That's what you have to keep in mind. Nevertheless, Joe Biden and Jay Powell are all, both saying, I'm sure, I'll take it. <laughs> we did see, as you mentioned, a flat reading for the overall CPI. A lot of that has to do with the drop that we've seen in oil prices and the drop that has followed that in gasoline prices. On a year-over-year -year basis, we fall to 8.5% from 9.1%. That's better than expected. And the core goes to 5.9%. Uh, that's the same as June, but it is lower than the 6.1% that had been expected. So overall, good news. Some of the categories that the Fed had called transitory, like rental cars, used cars, hotels, did start to go down. And so there is some evidence that we're starting to see uh, the decline of inflation, or at least we've seen peak inflation. And that's good news for the administration, because you look at what's happening, and Jay Powell's view of what a soft landing would be is kind of coming into sight right now. We're looking at an unemployment rate that is going down as inflation falls and instead of going up. And that means that uh, at this point, a soft landing remains possible. We we can hope. Yeah, I don't want to find a half-empty glass here, but what about uh, housing? Housing is still going up, uh, but we know that the housing market is starting to cool because uh, sales are down, prices are finally starting to level off or fall, and so it's going to take some time to get into the markets, but it is falling. The one thing that maybe the administration's not going to be too happy about is inflation-adjusted hourly earnings, which comes mm -hmm. out with this report, still way behind the inflation rate. So Americans are still going to be feeling the pain of inflation for some time. Real way is still lagging. So thank you so much to Michael McClue, McKee, our very own here at Bloomberg. Well, we've heard also this morning from the President of the United States, Joe Biden, for his reaction to the CPI numbers. We're seeing a stronger labor market where jobs are booming and Americans are working. And we're seeing some signs that inflation may be getting to moderate. That's what happens when you build an economy from the bottom up and the middle out. The wealthy do very well and everyone has a chance. It gives everyone a chance to make progress. And now let's get the perspective of the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo. So, M Madam Secretary, thank you for joining us. These clearly are encouraging numbers. Certainly it looks like inflation was not going as fast as people thought it was. From your perspective, have you had an opportunity to take a look at this and see why it may be encouraging, and specifically how much of it might be less demand as opposed to more supply? Because I know you've been focused on more supply. Yeah, good morning. Good to be with you. So, you know, it is good news. It is good news, although I do think we have to be cautious. Uh, a, a big reason for the good news, gas prices are leveling off, and uh, that's certainly helpful to consumers. But as you point out, um, there are other issues way, like in housing that we have to still keep our eye on the ball. Uh, as we've said all along, there's no silver bullet here. You know, we have to increase supply. Yesterday with the CHIPS Act, that's a huge step forward. We need to increase supply of chips. Uh, we need to increase supply of gas, like what the president has been doing with the petroleum reserves. Uh, and But we cannot, as they said, take our eye off the ball because we're not out of the woods on this, and we're going to continue to try to alleviate uh, the high prices for consumers. So I want to come back to the CHIPS Act in just a moment, because you and I have talked about that quite a bit. But just before that, on supply chain, because that's something you spent a lot of time on also. 
Where are we, do you think, on fixing the supply chain? And specifically, let me give you an example. There was a piece on the Bloomberg actually showing the record profits, above record profits, for container lines, actually. A lot of the shipping companies make a lot of money. How are we doing on things like shipping costs? Uh, we've made an awful lot of progress, but we're not there yet. So a year ago, six months ago, our ports were clogged. They were congested. They weren't moving. We had a shortage of truck drivers. Uh, that has been largely alleviated. You know, we went after that problem and, and we're feeling good about that. The price gouging that you just identified by the freight companies, that's, we are still working on that. Better than it was, still, you know, more to do. One of the areas you saw uh, coming down with inflation this month is appliances. You know, appliances prices are coming down. That is a direct link to uh, supply chains, you know, unsticking supply chains. So I think we have made a great deal of progress on, on unsticking supply chains in many of the areas that I just said. Having said that, we're not there yet. You see it all over the world. You know, you know as well as I do, all over the world, uh, COVID wreaked havoc with our supply chains. And I feel great about what we've done, but still there's more to do. Madam Secretary, let's go to that Chips and Science Act. Uh, as I say, you and I have talked about it. You've been very explicit. We need it, we need it fast. Congratulations, it got done. Now let's talk about the fast part. $52 billion in essentially industrial policy. The United States of America hasn't done that much of it. How, what is the process by which you actually get that money out and working? Yeah, so as you say, it's a huge day. With the stroke of a pen yesterday, President Biden uh, ensured that we'll be able to secure our national security by making the chips in America that we need for cars, airplanes, military equipment, et cetera. And by the way, uh, we'll create hundreds of thousands of high paying jobs in the process. So that's huge. We are already at work here at the Commerce Department. It's my department that will administer that money. And uh, we are in the process now of building a team uh, and we're going to get the money out as fast as we can, you know, which is to say uh, within months, not years, working with the private sector to make sure that this is transparent. We hold these companies accountable. It's not a blank check. But I know we need to move swiftly and we will do that. La the last thing I'll say is this. The fact that we got that bill across the finish line has been a huge signal to industry that they ought to invest in America and not in Asia or Europe. And you're already seeing that. You know, yesterday, Micron announced $40 billion investment in the United States. A couple of days ago, uh, Global Foundries announced a partnership with Qualcomm expanding in the United States. So I think you're going to see effects immediately because this is a signal to industry invest in the U.S. So, Madam Secretary, let me ask you about specifically about that, about the private sector, because the theory of this bill, as I understand it, is there'll be a multiplier effect. It's $52 billion, but there'll be many times that. Do you have an estimate of how big that multiplier effect is in terms of private investment piggy banking on the pro public? I'd say at least four or five times the amount, if not more. Our goal is to maximize it. Uh, but as, as big as $52 billion is, it is a drop in the bucket, a very big drop in the bucket towards what this economy needs. Uh, it is an amount that we hope is enough to unlock two, three, four hundred billion dollars on behalf of private industry. And that's the way that we are going to administer the program. Madam Secretary, the origins of this bill, as I recall, it was pending for quite some time, were in part at least to make sure we could be competitive with China. Let's talk about China and trade with China for a moment. We have heard from President Biden he's considering modifying those tariffs that were imposed under the Trump administration. I guess my simple question that a lot of people are asking is, why is it taking so long to decide what to do with those tariffs? Yeah, he is still considering it. It's a big decision, obviously. The geopolitical situation with China is complicated. Uh, candidly, right now, uh, after Speaker Pelosi's uh, visit to Taiwan, it's particularly complicated. So the president is weighing his options. Uh, he is very cautious. He wants to make sure that we don't do anything which would hurt American labor and American workers. Um, but I expect that, I know he's looking at it. Uh, we've talked about it again recently, and I expect he'll be making a decision uh, before too long. Uh, so behind the scenes, are there discussions going on and is the Commerce Department involved in with Ch your Chinese counterparts, uh, not only on those tariffs, but more broadly on trade? Are there some back channel discussions going on that could lead to something down the road? 
I would say yes, but they are limited at this point in time, uh, mainly because China has not been that interested to engage. Uh, and it, so we are trying. We certainly think that there is a benefit to having communication, back-channel communication, uh, but it, it takes two. It takes two. And so hopefully China will be increasingly interested in having those discussions with us. Uh, you mentioned, actually, uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. To what extent has that slowed down or derailed those back-channel discussions? Uh, certainly has made it a little more challenging. As I said, at, at this moment, um, it's harder. But I am hopeful that we will get beyond that and get back to a place where we can have more of those discussions. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, this is obviously an attempt for the United States to have a lot more investment, be much more efficient, productive in producing chips. China has its own challenges. It's, it has its own programs in trying to develop its own chips. I know the United States has really curtailed shipment of chip-making equipment to China. Could you give us a sense of where you are, the Commerce Department is on that process? Yes. We are... Uh, we spend time on this every single day. We have to make sure that no leading edge, cutting edge technology in semiconductors, or for that matter, any technology, goes from the United States to China, period. And that's a complicated analysis, right? So we wanna make sure that to the extent that our software, our tooling, our chips, our leading edge, most sophisticated, our intellectual property, that can't get into the hands of China. And so we're using our export controls effectively to do that. Having said that, we have to work with our allies, right? What good is it if we block the sale of our technology, but the Chinese can buy that from Germany or the Netherlands or Japan? So the way I think about this is be as strict as possible have very, very high walls around our most uh, sophisticated technology, but do it with our allies so it's effective uh, and not denying U.S. companies revenue. And that is, that's an ongoing process, uh, but we are doing it very effectively, I would say. I mean, look, you look at Huawei, the export controls that the Commerce Department imposed on Huawei has significantly um, hurt Huawei's ability to compete and get ahead of U.S. tech companies. So this is, it's, we have to be vigilant is the bottom line. Okay, Madam Secretary, we always really appreciate your spending time with us. That's Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo. Coming up, we go through the CPI numbers with Laura Tyson, former director of the National Economic Council and former chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. To keep you up to date with news from all around the world, we turn now to Mark Crumpton here with The First Word. David, thank you. Donald Trump says he won't answer questions by the New York Attorney General invoking his Fifth Amendment right. Mr. Trump is being deposed today in connection with a probe into the value of his real estate holdings. The former president claims he and his company are, quote, attacked from all sides, end quote. The deposition was delayed a month because of the death of his former wife, Ivana. It comes two days after federal investigators searched Mr. Trump's Florida home. Republicans echoed the assertion that the search was politically motivated. Massive explosions at a Russian military airfield in Crimea were greeted with uh, jubilation in Ukraine and consternation in Moscow. Russian authorities quickly denied rumors of a Ukrainian missile strike, blaming the destruction on munitions detonating at the base. While Ukrainian officials didn't directly claim responsibility, a top aide to President Volodymyr Zelensky called yesterday's blast, quote, just the beginning. Meantime, U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin reinforced a pledge that Washington and its allies will continue supplying military aid to Ukraine to help it expel Russia's invasion. A Russian journalist who staged an anti-war protest on the country's main TV news channel says police raided her home as part of a new fake news probe against her. Marina Svanikova says 10 police and officers from the investigative committee, Russia's equivalent of the FBI, searched her apartment early today and took her away for questioning. 
Russia has resumed oil flows toward Ukraine through a pipeline to Central Europe. The largest oil refiner in Hungary says it resolved a dispute that led to a halt in oil flows to Central Europe. European sanctions had prevented Russia from paying a transit fee to Ukraine to let the oil pass through. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, most of us started this morning with those CPI numbers, consumer price index numbers. He came in substantially better than what was feared, showing inflation at least for one month wasn't as bad as people expected. Earlier today, we spoke with former Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers and got his reaction to these numbers. We knew that the headline number was going to be coming substantially down because we could see what had happened with gasoline prices. The core number was better than most people uh, expected. Uh, that's certainly better than the alternative uh, to that. On the other hand, it was heavily driven by volatile sectors. We've sort of seen this movie before. For another perspective, from a great economist, we turn to Laura Tyson. She's professor at the UC Berkeley Haas School of Business. Dr. Tyson is the only person to have served as both director of the National Economic Council and chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, both under President Clinton. So, Dr. Tyson, thank you so much for being here. I guess Pleasure. should we be should we be relieved by these numbers? Do you think? You know, I, I, I like your, you had an interview also earlier in the show with Gina Raimondo, and she said the words I would use. This is a good number. It's a positive surprise. It's a positive surprise on both core and headline. Energy prices have played a big role in this. Uh, the inflation rate remains high. It may, in fact, have peaked, but we need to be cautious. One month's number does not tell the whole story. I do think, however, that that number, along with the very strong jobs number that came out, suggests that we're not likely to see a recession this year. So people worried about recession this year, I think uh, that concern has been alleviated. I think the numbers suggest that uh, the effort to get a soft landing here may, may work, may work, but we need to be cautious because these are one month numbers. And indeed, from the Fed's point of view, uh, they're looking for unambiguous evidence that the inflation rate is coming down and one month's number is not going to be unambiguous evidence. So that's what I would say. Cautious, right. optimistic, uh, let's not be overboard here. This was good news, but... Well it's one month. Laura, let's pursue that soft landing you just raised for a moment, because they're good numbers, but still headline year over year is 8.5 percent. That's a long exactly. way from 2 percent, from 2 percent. Exactly. Is, exactly. Should 2 percent still be the Fed's goal? And can they get there in a realistic t time period without putting us into a recession? It depends, I would say, on their time period. I mean, 2% long term does seem to be a realistic goal. If you kind of look at uh, market inflation expectations five years out and 10 years out, they're still giving uh, an expectation that the economy can get there. Uh, and so I think this is going to be the pace at which we get there. Um, one of the issues for the Fed is going to be they claim they would like a neutral interest rate by the end of this year, 2022. Well, what is going to be the inflation rate by the end of this year around that neutral interest rate? Mm. So if it comes down to 5% uh, percent inflation, for example, right. that suggests a neutral rate in the area of 5%. And so I think we, we have to look at the pace. Uh, and I still think that the Fed's view, and I think it's a perfectly reasonable view, is that you can reduce the, the hot temperature right now in the labor market. Uh, and that does not mean a significant increase in the unemployment rate. It simply means that you stop having uh, almost 
you know, 1.8 job openings for every unemployed right. person. So right. the number of openings may go down, but right. that doesn't lead firms to actually lay off the workers they currently have. So, right. so that's the kind of possibility right. of a um, cool approach right. to bringing the inflation down in a soft landing way. And the evidence so far, but it's very early, suggests that the that we're on path to do that. Okay, Professor, it's always so great to have you with us. Really appreciate your time. That's Dr. Laura Tyson of the UC Berkeley Haas School of Business. Still to come, we're going to talk with Alaska Governor Mike Dunleavy about what the Inflation Reduction Act will mean for his state. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We've been talking about those CPI numbers all morning long. Let's check on how the markets are reacting to them. For that, we welcome Abigail Doolittle. Well, David, there is certainly a bullish reaction to this report. For once, or at least for the first time in a long time, good news is good news. It's good news for markets because it means that the Fed uh, may be less aggressive. We're now looking more likely at a, a rate hike in September of 50 basis points. It's good news for Americans because the main reason that we had inflation go down in the month of July, gasoline. So what a relief. I will say, though, on an objective basis, we're still looking at inflation at 8.5 percent. Yeah, gasoline still up 44 percent year over year. Food still up in a big way. But to Today, investors will take it. And there is reason to think that this rally that we're seeing will continue. That was going to be a question. How are you feeling about the bear market rally? I think it's, it? I, yeah, I think it's going to probably go for a number of weeks more, maybe even a month. And one reason, we have the dollar. It's absolutely breaking down today. It's down 1%, breaking below critical support, suggesting it's going to go down more. A weak dollar in a decent environment, that's fuel for risk assets to go higher. So it's pretty likely that we're going to see that. But in the meantime, bonds didn't move that much. Yeah, well, no, actually, I think that there's a pretty decent move in bonds. Uh, you have that ten year, that two year yield uh, earlier uh, down sixteen basis points. I was right looking now. at the, the ten year is like one point three. Yeah, and it had been down more earlier. Earlier it had been down, I believe, nine basis points. Oh. But it's interesting actually. Now that you're saying that, that thirty year bond, the long bond, it's actually backing up four basis points. It's so interesting. Yeah. The yield curve, though, this is interesting. It's less inverted. Still very inverted, yeah. but 39 <laughs> yeah. basis but points. But it was pretty opposed, inverted. <laughs> it is. But there's a little bit of relief yeah. here with all of these there different uh, moves among yeah. the cross assets. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. Coming up, we're going to talk about the geopolitics of supply chains with former Secretary of Commerce Carlos Gutierrez. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm David Weston. To keep you up to date with news from all around the world, we turn now to Mark Crumpton here with the first word. David, thank you. President Biden says the U.S. economy is starting to see signs that inflation may be moderating after the consumer price index reading for July came in cooler than expected. Today, we received news that our economy had 0% inflation in the month of July. 0%. Here's what that means. While the price of some things go up, went up last month, the price of other things went down by the same amount. The result, zero inflation last month. The people were still hurting. The latest numbers give the president a much needed boost ahead of the November midterm elections. The UK's Foreign Office has summoned the Chinese ambassador over Beijing's, quote, aggressive and wide-ranging escalation against Taiwan, end quote. Meantime, China has ended those unprecedented military exercises near Taiwan, but says it plans to conduct regular patrols in the region. The Chinese began the drills last week after U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi defied Beijing and visited Taiwan. In Europe, another heat wave is sweeping the continent, threatening to disrupt travel and business and putting more pressure on the region's strained power infrastructure. Temperatures will be in the 90s in Paris and London. The bone dry conditions have prompted limits on water use. France last month suffered its driest July on record, while England recorded the driest in almost 90 years. 
several of Europe's major rivers are running dry, disrupting $80 billion in trade routes. The Rhine has dried up to the point of becoming virtually impassable at a key waypoint. That is slowing down vast flows of diesel and coal. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, whether it is Russia in Ukraine or the problems between Taiwan and China, or for that matter, Iran and a possible nuclear expansion, there are a number of geopolitical issues that ha are on the agenda of every CEO of companies around the world right now, and they really impinge on supply chains and exactly how one might restructure them to protect against geopolitical risk. We welcome now Carlos Gutierrez. He's CEO and co-founder of Empath. Mr. Gutierrez served as Secretary of Commerce under President George W. Bush. And before that, he was CEO of Kellogg. So, Carlos, great to have you back with us. Give us your perspective you. on the way that the geopolitical risks that we're seeing all around the world right now affect the CEO as the CEO tries to restructure their supply lines. Yeah, this is a, a, a difficult time because of the uncertainty, but... Uh, the supply line is still being impacted by China, of course, because they, they have a zero COVID policy. It's hard to imagine how you get to a zero COVID situation, but because of that, supply chains still have not geared up for you know, the way they were before. Um, so that, that's a big problem. And as those new costs hit, that will impact inflation in the U.S. as well. Um, so supply chains are beginning to come back. But no, there's uh, there's a lot to do still. China is still uh, a problem, um, and supply chains are moving. As uh, you know, I, I heard the, the comment about Mexico. Not a lot yet has been moved to countries nearby, but I think ultimately that is the the solution that a lot of CEOs are thinking about: is can we bring it closer to home? Especially as there is a perception that the world is regionalizing. Uh, so therefore, let's think about the world in a regional context, North America, Europe, Asia. Uh, and I think that's where things are going and the way CEOs are thinking about this. But it's China right now that, that, it, that it needs to open up uh, their exports and their economy uh, to where it was. Well, let's stay on China for a moment, and then I'll come back to nearshoring or friendshoring, as some people call it. Uh, to what extent did uh, Speaker Pelosi's uh, visit to Taiwan complicate that situation further, do you think? Yeah. You know, David, the, I think our problem with China is that it's all about tactics. We we don't really have a policy. We don't have a strategy. So uh, Speaker Pelosi's trip was just one more tactic. And what is the strategy? What did we get out of it? And, you know, the dangerous part is we have a very tense situation with Russia, you know, that, that's also subject to uh, misunderstandings. Uh, we have 10 situations with uh, with uh, Iran, with North Korea. Do we need to pick a fight with China on the single biggest issue that China has? At a time when President Xi has the Communist Party Congress later on this year, November, that's when he will be named um, uh, a president for life or he will continue he cannot afford to show weakness. So this was done at probably the worst time. And what did we get for it? And, you know, they're just, they're, there's too much uh, discussion around, well, we're going to show China once and for all. We're going to stop China once and for all. Uh, there is no once and for all. And I think we have to realize that the only solution here is coexistence. Mm -hmm. It can't be either we go to war or we don't. We have to coexist. We have to um, we have to do business together. We have to find ways of solving problems together. Uh, but we can't, um, you know, it, it can't continue to be this. It, it seems like it's the last stand and we're going to take on China. That's over. That doesn't exist. This isn't 1995, 96. It's yeah. a different China. It would be... Uh, a, a disaster if right. if there are a war between China and the U.S. and I think it's our responsibility to avoid that. Yeah. And you know, a trip like Speaker Pelosi's, as well intended as it was, uh, 
I think, just uh, sparked the Chinese mm -hmm. government in a way that we haven't seen in a long time. Yeah, I suspect an awful lot of people might agree with what you're saying. It makes good sense. At the same time, it's sort of above the pay grade, even if a lot of CEOs to try to fix that problem. What about the supply chain issue, though? Come back to what you talked about with things, things like the nearshoring. Uh, Mexico is often talked about as perhaps the most natural, sensible place in the United States. And yet I wonder if it really has proven out. Uh, are, are CEOs moving in that direction? Because I don't have the sense they're moving as fast as people talk about. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, Mexico this year will grow about one seven, which is less than the U.S. Uh, next year, they're forecast to grow about half a percent, which for a country like Mexico, with the potential, with a border with the U.S., uh, that's that's not that's that's uh, it's unacceptable. It should be unacceptable. Part of the problem is that uh, the current government in Mexico has not proven to be uh, business friendly, and they're going back to policies of the 1970s, when Mexico talked about self-sufficiency and controlling foreign direct investment and not being at the mercy of multinational corporations, that's back. Uh, and there have been a number of moves that the government has made that, that actually makes it risky. You know, investments that have been made, projects that have been open, uh, and the government has just canceled them and investors are waiting to see what happens. So that hasn't played well uh, Mexico is also taking a, a more aggressive foreign policy position, which is very rare for Mexico. And as you know, they got had this diplomatic quarrel with the U.S. regarding the Summit of the Americas and whether Cuba would attend. That's very unlike Mexico. So uh, AMLO is changing things to the point that investors are going to wait. They're going to wait to see what happens. He wants to do a referendum to see if the country will give him another six years. That's a, you know, it's a scary thought. What would he do with another six years? And I think that's what's bothering business and, and what's holding them back uh, today. Do you have any sense about that referendum? Because when AMLO first came into office, a lot of people thought he might temper his position. It doesn't seem like he's done that with respect to business at this point. So it sounds like as long as he's there, they're going to have those policies. What are the prospects of his actually getting another six years? You know, I, I think it's a tough one because the, the, the one thing that Mexico has touted about their constitution is you serve one term. That is known by the country, voters. Uh, it, it is a sacred principle of their constitution. So there may be people who, who like AMLO who are thinking about we shouldn't be doing this. This, this goes against the grain of, of who we are as a country. Having said that, uh, he has over 50% approval. Some polls have him as high as 60, 65%. Uh, he has done things that are very clever and that capture the attention of the average person. Uh, he, dry, he, he doesn't have his own airplane. He flies commercial. He right. moved his office. And people see that as a step forward. It's no longer the yeah. arrogant politician. He's going up against corruption, yeah. or at least he's talking about it. Right. So uh, you don't know, David. It, it, it's it's not out of the question. This has been so terribly helpful, as it always is when you're with us, Carlos. Thank you so much. That's Appreciate Carlos Gutierrez, Empath co-founder and CEO. Coming up, the Inflation Reduction Act addresses climate and energy, two critical issues in Alaska. And we'll talk about them with Governor Mike Dunleavy. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Inflation Reduction Act looks like it's on its way to passage by the House of Representatives when it votes, convenes specifically to vote on it this coming Friday. And it includes provisions, of course, involving climate, energy, and spending, all issues really important to the people of Alaska. We welcome now the man who is the governor of the largest state of the union. He is Mr. Mike Dunleavy. So, Mike, thank you so much for being back with us. Give us your sense from up there in Alaska of your perspective on this Inflation Reduction Act. Well, I, I, I'm not sure if it reduces uh, uh, inflation. As a matter of fact, I, I think it's basic economics, David. When you spend more money in an inflationary period, it, uh, it's difficult to understand how you reduce inflation. For example, we're looking at about 8% uh, 8, 8 plus inflation right now staring at us, as well as um, the fact that if this bill passes as it is, 
it's going to have a tax burden, an average tax burden on the average family of about $4,500 over the next decade. So you, you couple that tax burden with inflation, uh, it's, it's really hard to see how we reduce it. And, by, and plus, the, the fact of the matter that the, the, the uh, reduction part of it and the inflation part of it really is in the back end of this. So up front, you're going to get probably, unfortunately, more inflation, and that's going to be problematic for all Americans, including us here up here in Alaska. Well, at the same time, it, it does reduce the deficit. Some people say it's not a lot to reduce it, but it does it. It actually pays for it by taxes, some of those taxes you talk about. And when you talk about increasing the taxes on uh, the average American, the studies that I've seen suggest that actually if you net it against, for example, some of the breaks people will get, ordinary working families will get on uh, health care, that in fact it's a plus for them. You must have that up in Alaska, a lot of people with a lot of health care costs. Oh yeah, we do. We we we're, like other states are. We have high health care costs that we're uh, working on. But um, uh, all in all, I, I do think when you look at the bill as it is now, um, it's going to cost more upfront, and it's going to impact, especially once again on the inflationary side of things. Um, you know, well, what else is also included in this bill? Obviously, is an increase in royalties on uh, things like uh, oil and gas. And uh, that's going to impact places like Alaska as well. But that also translates later down the road into the pumps for the average American, too. And so, um, I, I, you know, we are, we're always hopeful that when a bill comes out of Washington that it really doesn't impact negatively the people of Alaska and the people of this country. But uh, too often it does. And the other thing, David, I think is really important is with a lot of this spending, for example, on this particular bill, on broadband, on climate, on renewables, et cetera, Unless there's a change in the uh, permitting process in Washington and some of the agencies, whether it's EPA, uh, Department of the Interior, Fish and Wildlife, those, those, those agencies impact Alaska a lot. Unless there's a change in how we do studies and how quickly we get the permits done, some of this money may not have an impact for quite some time, if at all, if the permitting processes in Washington don't uh, don't uh, change or accelerate. Yeah, and reports are that there's some sort of an agreement that they'll fix those, but that's not in this bill, as I understand it. That's something right. in the future. We'll see if it happens. What about the Cook Inlet up in Alaska? Uh, because that's something that, as I understand it, this would permit leases for oil and gas in Cook Inlet. How important is that to Alaska? Well, any, anytime we can, anytime we can develop a new oil and gas play in Alaska, it helps Alaska, it helps America, it helps the world by uh, putting more oil and gas into the system, which is going to reduce costs. Also helps Alaska, uh, uh, you know, for the, the purpose of jobs and potential uh, uh, royalty uh, for the state. Um, the devil's in the details again. We'll see what uh, what leases come up. We we had leases in Cook Inlet, but they uh, that process was shut down earlier. So we're really, um, we really have to see what the end game is with this bill, what it's really going to look like when it's done in the House. But again, we hope that um, whatever comes out of Washington does no harm. I mean, that's, that's kind of a, a mantra that we use up here. But in the end, um, uh, we're going to have to keep an eye on this because as it, as it looks now, it's going to cost us. Um, and that's a concern. Uh, Governor, another subject you and I have talked about in the past is climate and how sensitive Alaska is to climate change. <clears throat> I've seen reports that you may have a record number of wildfires going on right now. Give us an update on where you are on wildfires. Well, we did have a dry um, end of May, June, early July, and we were having a lot of lightning strikes in Alaska. Um, we've had several million acres burn here in the state of Alaska. We still have fires, even though the past several weeks we've been blessed with uh, uh, abundance of rain. And so we always have fires, David, up here in the summertime. It's just a massive state um, with different, uh, you know, different regions have different uh, climates and microclimates. But um, in the end, we've had a lot of fires this year. Uh, things were dry. Right now it's raining, which is good. And so we're going to be uh, assessing this well into the fall because we still have fires, um, fires going on now. Governor, of course, some of the provisions of the Inflation Reduction Act would uh, really be directed at greenhouse gas emissions and reducing those. Do the people of Alaska, are they sensitive to that issue? I mean, they obviously see climate change firsthand up there. Uh, are they enthusiastic about doing something to curtail greenhouse gas emissions? Well, I think everybody, you know, is concerned about what the future is going to hold in terms of the climate. I mean, we've all watched the 100-plus uh, degree temperatures in the lower 48, as we call the rest of the country. We're in Alaska. We, you know, we've been blessed. We've if you live in Alaska for any length of time, David, uh, you've got to appreciate cool weather. And so we've had a pretty good summer. We haven't seen temperatures in the 90s or 100s up here this summer. But nonetheless, um, we do notice, I mean, we do know that the Arctic is warming. We do know that the ice is thinning. And so I, I think there's a concern across the board as to where this is going to lead. Here in Alaska, <clears throat> you know, we're keeping an eye on things. And um, as you mentioned, that we have an issue with fires. But we also are looking at uh, 
what is uh, what is the future going to hold for, for example, transshipment across the Arctic from uh, European countries down through the Bering Strait? We're having discussions about how we would prepare for that. But um, again, Alaska is an all-in state when it comes to energy, oil, gas, and renewables. We uh, we have tremendous hydro that we use in Alaska. We have tremendous wind and solar uh, potential here in Alaska, and so. We believe that uh, using any and all approaches to produce low-cost energy is key. And if, um, for example, if uh, there's a reduction in carbon, that's uh, also a benefit for a lot of folks. Governor, it's always great to talk to you, get that Alaskan perspective. Thank you so much. That's Alaska Governor Mike Dunleavy. Coming up, President Trump takes the fifth in his deposition today in New York. We'll go over the various legal challenges the former president faces. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and well, President Trump is in New York today where he made an appearance at the office of Letitia James, the Attorney General, to give a deposition. But it appears that what he did when he went in was he invoked his privilege, as is his right under the Constitution of the United States, under the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination. To take us through this and other challenges the former president faces, we welcome now Greg Farrell. He's Bloomberg investigative reporter on our legal enforcement team. Greg, thanks so much for being here. You've been following all these things all along. So give us a sense specifically what the proceeding was today. Today is a civil case, as you pointed out, by New York's Attorney General Letitia James. And the purpose of her investigation, which is several years, is to uh, basically determine whether or not uh, the president abused, you know, tax, you know, uh, tax laws in New York, and particularly those regarding charities, uh, to get around paying taxes. She's amassed a lot of evidence. And uh, normally, as the president pointed out, when you take the Fifth Amendment, you know, it's uh, when you take the Fifth, it shouldn't be in a criminal case uh, held against you. However, this is a civil case. So if and when this goes to a jury, um, I think it's not going to be a difficult case at all. It'll be a civil case, it won't. I think the New York AG will win a case against the Trump organization and the Trump family for overvaluing assets for the purposes of you know, getting loans and undervaluing them for the purposes of paying taxes. Um, that's a, that's not a mortal blow to President Trump or the Trump empire, but it will be a costly one. So that's what is happening today. Um, there's the criminal case that now seems to be like on hold in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. But let's not forget that the CFO of the Trump Organization, Alan Weisselberg, um, has been accused of crimes, tax crimes, and uh, the Trump Organization has. That will go to trial, if not later this year than early next year. And that's very important as to whether or not a jury decides to convict Mr. Weisselberg. That will not reflect well on the president. Whereas if he's acquitted, that will be a vindication by, the pre by President Trump that he's been hounded by a bunch of over-aggressive prosecutors. Uh, and that's just here in New York. There's several other yeah, things. Ex exactly. On. I was going to say there are cases all around the country, including some in Washington, D.C. One of them, we had a D.C. Circuit yesterday rule again, I think, that the House committee can get access to his tax records. And then, of course, there's that search warrant that was executed by the FBI uh, earlier this week. Uh, but for most of us, that would be overwhelming. At the same time, Donald Trump, the person, has been in court a fair amount of his professional career, has he not? Yes, Um uh, lawyers for him. He actually doesn't go to court that much. And as you can see, he's not, it's very difficult to get him to actually testify under oath to say something. Even in the Mueller investigation, um, he and his legal team insisted that uh, Special Counsel Robert Mueller submit questions in writing. And rather than go to war, Mueller accepted that. So it was much easier to parry any questions Mueller had through, um, you know, questionnaires rather than put him in a box, yeah. you know, and have him swear an oath to it. Yeah. So uh, the things that are still going on, yeah. Um, yeah. yes, the so, I read about records. Yes, go ahead. Net, net, it's good to be his lawyer provided you get paid. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's Greg Farrell for that reporting. Check out the Balance of Power newsletter on the terminal and online. And this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.